thank you all for coming. Um, we are recording this, so if anyone would, is, um, would like it to remain private after the recording's finished, let me know at the end of this event, and we'll make sure not to make it public online, but the idea would be that we would share this recording um, online afterwards, so people who couldn't make it could see it after. Hello, welcome. Um, we have name tags scattered here. You can feel free to write your name, um, your preferred gender pronoun, if you like, and um, what else? Housekeeping, there is bathroom down that, bathrooms down that hallway. There's some water fountains. The, the ladies' bathroom is open, but I understand that that might not be the case for the whole event. They might lock them. Other, in that case, there's bathrooms downstairs somewhere. Not sure exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you to, to Shay and to Grace and the Mockabee and CCTV for venue and recording and all sorts of stuff. Thank you. Thank yes. You. Oh, and also to say for those of you who know me that I am I am not here in official Burlington Telecom capacity today. I'm here as Abby Tycocky. So. Um, Anyone who has uh, uh, things they want to discuss about any sales-related things, I'm happy to stay after and, and hear that, but this is something separate. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. Thanks, Abby. And thank you for helping me connect with all these folks. OK. Um, so momentarily, I would like to go do a round of introductions and hear all where you're all coming from, what brought you here. Um, to give some context for this particular event, I'll do an introduction of myself um, and this particular event. And then we'll jump into some stuff that I prepared to look over and then get to some activity where we're brainstorming about particular questions and topics um, related to digital inclusion. So, so my name's Julia Valera. I'm relatively new to the area. I, I moved here about a year and a half ago, a little less than that. So I, I'm really excited and inspired by the energy and the people that I've been meeting since I've been here. Um, I've had great conversations about internet-related issues, uh, and a few of them being related to digital inclusion and web literacy in the area. Um, I'm really excited by the initiatives and the services and the, um, the various projects that I'm learning about uh, si since I came here. So, so I'm here as someone who is very passionate about the topic of digital inclusion. Um, I've been working on that topic and web literacy uh, for the last, last six years. And I moved here from New York City. Um, and then in addition to that, I've been working in, uh, in the area of media and arts for fifth, over 15 years, probably closer to 17 now. Um, so I really, I'm kind of at this intersection between um, digital inclusion, technology, art, design, and I dabble in all of those things and often they overlap. So I'm here uh, just to meet everyone and really dig in more with all of your expertise in the room. Um, and I've been managing a lot of local and global projects as well. Um, the work, I, I, I work at Mozilla Foundation right now, and before that I was working with a lot of different nonprofits in New York City, um, running events and, and doing different types of trainings for professionals, teachers, young people, um, collaborating on lots of projects with fellow artists and designers. So, so I'm just, I'm very excited about the idea of collaboration. Um, and that's what brings me here. This particular event, um, I'm hoping is, is the first of many more. So we had a previous event during Innovation Week um, that drew a lot of interested people on the topic of internet health um, and lots of issues that tie into that. And this is, this is the kind of continued conversation of that event, but I think drilling down into the digital inclusion piece of that, which we're gonna do today, is really a good start to thinking about what we wanna do to move forward, and with all the people in the room, how we can leverage that um, in, in continuing this conversation. 
And then just the last thing is that it's a flexible agenda. So, um, so this is, I'm very much interested in hearing the expertise that you're bringing here tonight. Um, and so I've, I've kind of created an outline and an agenda and have topical questions to, to get to. But at the same time, like I want to hear from you and, and feel free to you know, surface questions or thoughts or any relevant examples as we move, out, move on throughout the event tonight. Um, so with that said, just briefly, this is what we're, we're, we'll be going through. We're going to do introductions. Um, I'm going to do, go through some slides that cover um, some information related to local initiatives and, and um, statistics. And then we're going to do a group activity that I'll talk more in detail about. And then I will really want to take a good amount of time, like 10 minutes or so at the end, to have reflections. So we'll, we'll have some time to maybe give feedback on this event, what we could do better next time, what we need to include, and things like that. OK, so now I'd like to know about you all. Um, if we could go around the room and do a, our name, a preferred gender pronoun if you prefer to do that, and um, what brought you here today, where you're from, and I added your favorite winter activity here. Um, for selfish reasons, I'm very curious to know, since I'm new to the area, what all of you like to get into during the winter months. Um, yeah, and, and please try to keep it short just so we, there's a lot of people here so we can, you know, get through it all. So maybe no more than a minute each would be preferable. All right, so does any side of the room or corner want to start? Let's maybe go this way. Starting in this corner, here, there. <coughs> okay. Sounds good. Well, um, I didn't know what you were all about. I heard, um, Burlington Telecom, and that's what I'm interested in. Uh, as you know, we, we just had the, uh, the whole sale of that and everything involved with that. And um, so this kind of got my attention. Um, I'm not particularly interested in the internet. I never really learned it, and I frankly don't like it very much. And uh, I find it very difficult because it seems to change all the time. Yeah. And uh, unless you have somebody sitting right next to you telling you what's happening, you're just out of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, and my, I about ready to do that. <laughs> I'm Barbara Winroth, and um, I'd say to describe myself, I'm a community activist here Great. in Burlington. Thanks for coming. Sure. Oh, and uh, what's your favorite winter activity? Avoiding snow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well noted. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, I'm Dennis Moynihan. I'm the executive director for BTV Ignite. And uh, I'm here because digital inclusion is one of the things that we're very interested in. BTV Ignite. Our mission is to uh, position Burlington to thrive in a 21st century digital economy and digital inclusion, making sure we're inclusive and we have web, web literacy is a huge part of that. Um, and my favorite <coughs> winter activity probably involves something that comes with a cork in it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to back uh, maybe Stephen in the back and then jump back right. in front. Uh, Stephen Barraclough, I run Burlington Telecom. Um, what brought me here today is that we're in a, a very changing world and I think it's critically important to me and many people that somewhere like Burlington actually becomes a, an expression of what you can achieve in an engaged community on the front, on, the, on digital literacy and digital in, inclusion. You know, what can we do that actually brings the best of providing equal opportunity to everyone and actually have Burlington be an example of that. Um, my favorite winter activity used to be skiing. Um, as I got older, my favorite winter activity began, uh, became planning summer. 
<laughs> Good ones. Thank you. I'm Carolyn Bates. I'm from Burlington. I've been a resident here since 1973. I came today because um, some people from Burlington Telecom and from KBTL, of which I'm a member, suggested that I come. Um, and I have been an activist since way back in the early 90s when we were trying to put dog parks in the city. And so anything that seems to go across who I am or what I believe in, and I like to, you know, well, anyway, I just like to get things going right in the and not backwards. And so I hope that the internet and the net inclusion or net neutrality and all of this um, somehow I could help with that. And winter, well, let's see. I like walking on the ice along the lake to see all those summer cabins that I can't see in the summer. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. But you have to be sure the ice is <laughs> cold. Oh, yeah. All right, thank you. Welcome. So I'm Alan Matson. I um, have been very involved with the Key PT Local Cooperative that had put proposal forward for Beats uh, for going to telecom. Mm -hmm. I think we're trying to figure out next steps, and uh, I also know that Shay got us involved um, to help sponsor a bit, I think, through Rights and Democracy, uh, to help out with the evening this evening. And um, like I said, so I'm here partly thinking about per personally and with for the cooperative of what uh, next steps might be. Um, and I live in Vermont because I grew up in Minnesota and I love winters. It's hard to pick a favorite, but keeping on Carolyn's theme, I also like walking along the ice close to shore, but usually I need to have about 10 to 15 holes drilled with uh, my tip ups down in ice fishing. So. Ah, cool. There we go. Thank you. <coughs> Welcome. Uh, my name's Dan. Yeah. Uh, I'm a recent Burlington resident, moved about two weeks ago here. Uh, I work remotely with Harvard's Bertrand Klein Center for Internet Society doing research on internet content controls and censorship. I also just recently got back from a, a year-long travel fellowship on the topic of internet infrastructure, um, uh, censorship and surveillance around the world. And so I'm, I'm here to see what kind of initiatives are already in place, what kind of needs need to be addressed, um, to see if there's any room for volunteering and getting involved. Uh, I'm from Florida, so there's not a lot of difference <laughs> <laughs> between winter and the rest of the seasons, but I'll take any excuse for a hot chocolate. Nice. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, let's just get over here and then we'll bounce back. Uh, my name is Paul Sun. I'm the communications coordinator for the city of New York. Um, Abby's tweet actually very <laughs> appropriately is what brought me here. Uh, obviously, a lot of this stuff plays into the work we do in trying to communicate our programming and uh, the sort of city happens. I'd say right now my favorite winter activity is helping our community members understand the winter of our mm. <laughs> <laughs> Our community is uh, the winter park of Anton. Mm -hmm. the back really do a lot, so. The parking vans uh, in Winooski, the winter parking vans? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite activity. Yes. <laughs> On the computer? My computer? Oh. No, just let people know Sean is Thank you. We have someone Skyped in. Um, is he there? He turned off his video. Okay. Yeah, so um, Sean, Sean, can you hear me? Yep. You want to introduce yourself? Sean Kaya, I work with Abby and Portland Telecom. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be a part of this. Um, I'm semi snowed in up in Enosburg, uh, so uh, this is something that uh, I want to be a part of to kind of expand uh, digital inclusion, digital literacy, uh, outside of Chittenden County as well. Um, and then uh, my favorite winter activity is definitely skiing. I pretty much specifically moved to Vermont just to ski, so <laughs> good to see everybody. Thank you. All right, and then we'll bounce over here. I'm Sam Phillips. I'm a remote employee for Google. I uh, grew up in Vermont and got here about a year ago. And I'm 
Is Julia sent me a message after I published an article on medium about net neutrality and Burlington Telecom. And my favorite winter activity is going ice skating with my two girls who are four. Great. Thanks for coming. Uh, maybe we'll do zigzag, so we'll go straight back and then around. I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm Al Wagner. I'm a member of PPT Local. Uh, and uh, I'm here for the digital inclusion thing because I think it's incredibly important. And I, I agree with Stephen that we have an opportunity here to uh, create something that, that uh, the whole country can take a look at and, and learn from. Uh, and I hope we can pull that off. Uh, I've been here for, I don't know, since the early 90s. Um, and uh, I, uh, my job is helping people with their computers. Uh, so my favorite winter activity, I think, is shoveling snow. Uh, because, <laughs> because it gives me a great opportunity to get fit, stay fit, and, and get something accomplished same time. Uh, not that I don't like cross-country skiing and stuff like that, but I especially like snow shell. Um, that's great. Thank you. That's very funny. Uh, more on that later. So <laughs> my, <laughs> my name is Kit Andrews, and I've been uh, back here in Vermont since 1984, and I'm a member of KBTL Co-op, and what brings me here tonight is uh, I really value the KBTL co-op community and um, like to spend time with KBTL co-op people. I'm not quite as um, internet illiterate and phobic as Barbara is, but I'm pretty illiterate and <laughs> not deeply interested in that stuff. So, um, one of my favorite winter activities is snow shoveling. I had no idea someone else was going to say that. <laughs> You're sitting right next to each other, I perfectly know. positioned. <laughs> um, now, a favorite I'm activity. Over tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, a favorite activity around the holidays is to find a um, Messiah sing-along, and there's one tonight in the New North End, so I'm going to be leaving here early so I can go sing the Messiah. Oh, wow. Nice. Thanks for coming. We'll go right next to you in the back. I know. Yeah. I'm Don Schramm. I live in, in Burlington, in, at Burlington Co-Housing. I'm here because this seems to be an issue that Abby was really concerned about, and I thought, well, if she's concerned and interested in this, maybe it's something I should find out about. So I don't know much about it, but, uh, so that's why I'm here. And uh, my favorite winter activity when I can do it is cross-country skiing. Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Matt Kroc. Um, I've been uh, I spent a number of years in my 20s doing kind of frontline work doing computer literacy as a social worker with people who've been recently housed after having been homeless. So kind of, I've had my, my fingers in that world. My other affinities are I'm a member of the Laboratory B Hacker Space, and I'm generally involved in, as you know, a co-op movement soldier on many things, so KBTL ate a lot of my time over the last five years. Um, but I'm really sort of interested in seeing what um, what things the that kind of our community can pull together that are both um, Kind of ethically designed and non-extractive, and also very, very involved in the platform cooperativism movement. Um, so, curious to see what people bring to the table. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Andy Crawford. Uh, I work for CCTV, uh, which runs a bunch of different programs. One of them is Channel 17, 317 on uh, Comcast Cable. Um, my work there is mainly as a tech director. Yeah, sure. Uh, we run a bunch of programs at CCTV Channel 17. Um, we have a statewide nonprofit organization um, that helps provide capacity uh, planning for uh, Common Good Vermont into that. And then we have um, we also operate a small um, OpenStack cloud attached to the Burlington Telecom network. Um, so I'm interested in access to resources, digital resources. There's a lot of um, access to digital resources uh, for everything from civic data projects through um, small
small scale entrepreneurial projects with a focus on locals and hyper local uh, engagement. Um, I'm also interested in the politics of the small and large scale structure. So. Thanks. Um, Dave, David Lansky, I've lived in Burlington 20 some years. Um, I've been I'm on the board of KBT Local, KBT Local. Um, I've been, I'm the new member to the board, so it's only been about a year, and I've been very actively involved. Um, I'm here to, to join the conversation, and one of the places I'm hoping we're going is, um, if, if KBTL had managed to buy BT, what would we do with it? And how much of that can we do even though KBTL doesn't have it? Um, it and you know, that's figuring out those, those things we can act on gives us some direction. Um, and one of my favorite interactivities is dance. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Barbara Nolfi. I uh, have lived in Burlington for a long time. I live with Don, who's next door to me there. And uh, I am interested in uh, where, where we think we might be going. Um, I feel you know, pretty uh, uh, confident about uh, you know, technology. And uh, my favorite winter activity is probably sledding. Thanks for coming. We'll go diagonal. Oh, yeah. I'm Laurie Glendavidian. I work at CCTV, Center for Media and Democracy. Um, we've been interested in digital inclusion for many years, I would say since 1990 when we started the Old North Bend Community Technology Center. And um, my favorite winter activity is shoveling. There's <laughs> three. <laughs> Thank you for coming. My name is Sol Bay, and I live in the Old North End, uh, Burlington. I've been there since 1991. Um, and I'm here because I'm interested in, um, and I have a lot of concerns about the use of the internet and people not understanding some of the, the risks of things that are going on with commercialization and data profiling and manipulation and filtering. Uh, and so I'm very interested in trying to educate you know, people to understand some of those those factors that uh, that the cool factor about apps it sort of distracts people from really recognizing what's going on, and so I'm now thinking about ways to uh, that may and the inclusion part of it is part of it. Everybody understanding options for use of the use of the internet safely, <coughs> uh, but ways to you know, deal with potentially having to try to anonymize things so that you can actually use the internet without having to be profiled and monitored and tracked and filtered, and, uh, which I have a serious concern about, and helping people understand what programming is about and how you are being programmed if you do not understand the programming that is behind everything that's going on on the internet. And my favorite activity, I mean, I like shoveling too, which I just came from before I came here, but I, I like walking in and snowshoeing and uh, cross-country skiing and ice skating. Thanks for coming. My name is James Lockridge. Um, I'm from King Street, a couple blocks over, and I direct Big Heavy World, which is a volunteer-run nonprofit that supports local music. And for years, for close to 21 years now, we've used emerging technology to support our local music community. Um, so I've been a community builder there. Um, as a candidate for city council in Ward Three in Burlington, I have a very keen personal interest in inclusion of all kinds. And for winter activities, I I enjoy walking around downtown when it's snowing, you know, just seeing this, just living in a beautiful place. But my favorite of all, and this is a bit of an echo, is shoveling what the road plow gives me in front of the house. <laughs> I like the triumph of, you know, of that. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, hello, I'm Jessica Bray. Um, uh, I'm president of Laboratory B. Uh, some of my work has been uh, around um, trying to keep the civic cloud running and um, just generally promoting um, technology in the community. I imagine I'm probably one of the few people with an actual 
networking degree in the room, but not the only one. Um, maybe there's someone else. Um, so I do know a lot about the internet and technology. Um, um, I may bring that to the table. Um, and I endeavor to do as much work towards that, uh, towards really freedom of the internet and what I would say is internet works. Uh, um, in my role as president of the lab, I, I kind of feel that's part of it is that everyone has a network and the internet work is a network of networks and really all you're buying when you're buying an ISP is the ability to connect to other people's networks and if people don't understand that on a fundamental level, I don't, I don't think we're explaining it very well. Um, my day job is at CCTV, but I think that sometimes takes me away from my work like many people's jobs. But I think the internet helps you get your work done. Winter sport, or winter activity? Um, probably I'll say video games. Um, particularly doing like good. flight sims okay. where I get a lot of blue skies and like <laughs> helps with like seasonal not seeing blue skies. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> nice. Thanks for coming. I'm Mary Danko. I'm the director of the Fletcher Free Library. Um, the library has a long tradition of digital inclusion um, and providing internet service to the community, so we're always very interested uh, in this conversation. Uh, particularly, I'm interested here in Burlington, uh, we have this incredible internet service access to everyone, but not everyone is getting it. So I'm really interested in trying to find hard data on what are the barriers, why people are not getting connected, and what we can do um, to help that. Okay. What do you like to do in winter now? Oh, in perfect conditions, cross-country skiing. But <laughs> can't be sticky, can't be too cold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for coming. So I'm <clears throat> Dodi Chibamba. I work for the Fletcher Free Library. I am one of the people who run the tech center. So we are dealing like each basic day with people who want to access on the internet and people who want some help with their computers. So I think this is a good meeting to know about more about what people need and if we can give or add some experience about what we are dealing with every day by participating in this kind of meeting. So for the winter activity, <laughs> I just, I'm new in the snow and I don't have like uh, a particular winter activity. That's okay. <laughs> you get lots of ideas. Stay warm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm gonna. I'm gonna let Abby come back. We're back just in time. Okay. So this Abby. is Henry. He's three and super into digital inclusion. <laughs> I want to pee in the potty. And he would pee in the potty. Oh, good job, Henry. Good job. <laughs> and I'm um, Abby Takaki, and I almost simultaneously moved out of Burlington to Essex and started working for the city at Burlington Telecom which, um, for better or for worse, um, has given me the opportunity to meet all of you um, and get really passionate about fiber internet technology, smart cities, gigabit cities. I'm also an executive fellow of BTV at night. And, um, and, and Stephen, although he may be regretting it today, uh, was the one who said, look more into this digital divide thing um, and find out how it can um, be implemented here and it, it got me really um, worked up and passionate about um, the frustrating lack of data that we have in the city even though everyone knows there's a need. Um, so I had a really great experience during Innovation Week with Julia and I'm excited to, um, that she's excited that she's excited to continue the discussion. Um, and my favorite winter activity uh, just in the past three years has become making snowmen. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. And snow and snow people. <laughs> Trying to be inclusive. Very good. Yes. With snow and inclusive. <laughs> um, great. So did we get everyone? I think we did. Awesome. So 
Um, there are a few goals for today. I'll back up so you can see these. And again, we're f this is a flexible, can you hear me okay? We're good. Um, this is a flexible event, so we can steer in whatever direction we need to steer in. But in general, um, we want to tonight draw attention to the digital divide that impacts many diverse communities here in, the Burlington, in Burlington, but also in Burlington area. Um, we want to identify what we are all currently doing, so that was a great start, um, and what we could be doing to increase digital inclusion in the area. And then also just to figure out ways to leverage the uniqueness of this area. So our large uh, new American population and the universities that we have here, um, the, the services that are available, like all of these really great resources, um, really think about how to leverage those in the best way. Um, so very quickly, the last event we did, in case some of you weren't there, um, was an event that focused on a broad view of internet health. And that's a term that um, has been getting more and more attention lately. Mozilla Foundation has been uh, doing a lot of work around five issues related to internet health. And one of those issues is digital inclusion. Another one of those issues is web literacy. Um, and some of the, out these, are, these questions were, were what we really focused that event on. So you can see as you read them, they're pretty broad facing. Um, but some of the outcomes of that were, there seemed to be some trends happening. So one of the trends um, after, or during the event, and then as we looked at the notes afterward, afterward was the, the need for more data. So like a lot more granular data on what we know about who's using the internet, why they're using it, why they're not using it, and how you know, that may paint a picture of gaps and places where we need to really um, focus on. And then another one of those outcomes that we noticed was um, ne the need to share the resources that already exist more um, more on the forefront of, of the communities that we work in and that we serve and, and are a part of because we do have a lot here already. So that was another thing. Um, and I think another one was just that there's a lot of um, examples out there that, that we can draw from, um, that from other cities that are close to our size or um, have a similar, um, I don't know, geographical location and access that we do that we could really learn from. So those were some bigger outcomes. Um, so today, uh, we decided to drill down you know, onto the, into the digital inclusion topic uh, specifically. And before we do that and look at some other stuff, I just wanted to make some clarifications about terms. So um, there's two here. One is digital divide and one is, one is digital inclusion. And those terms often are used simultaneously or in conjunction with each other. But for the sake of this event, I just wanted to clarify kind of how they're different. So um, digital divide is a term that refers to inequalities in the access that people have to information technology. Um, so, so that's a very specific way of, um, of pointing to gaps that we know exist. And then digital inclusion is more of a framework, and um, that framework is, is used to assess and um, consider the readiness of communities to provide access to communities. And then within that framework, and again, these are, these are definitions, there's many definitions out there, many, and um, a lot of them are great. I picked these because I think they really kind of are quick and easy to understand for the context of this event. So to think about digital inclusion as a framework here, there's three areas we can think of, access, adoption, and application. So the access is just the simply the, the affordability and the availability um, <clears throat> of these tools and these resources that connect people digitally. And then the adoption is that digital literacy piece, so how people understand it, um, how secure they are and safe they are using it. And then the application of it, so how they're using it to better their lives and 
um, create opportunities and seek out opportunities in a community. So that's kind of the framework we're talking about when we're, ta when we're talking about digital inclusion. Um, this is a great quote that was, I pulled from a research project um, called Digital Inclusion Survey. Um, it was from an association, association Yes. Um, is, is, will this be better? I'm worried about the mic, though. I'm OK? OK, I'm trying to speak loudly. Um, yes. Hold the mic. I think I'm OK. Can you hear me, Alex? Yeah. If you'd like to hold the mic, that would be fine. Oh, OK. Let's try that, then. I think it'll be okay. I'll manage. You've got plenty of slack down here. All right. Um, so yeah, so you can take a take a read. I won't read it verbatim, um, but basically, th this quote is referring to that that fact that access is one thing, but then there's a larger issue of how people understand what they're accessing and, and how they apply that. Um, Mimi Ito is a researcher and the founder of Connected Learning Research Network. This is another great quote that I think does a nice job um, of demonstrating how the, um, the way that we disperse these tools and the way that we're informing people about them and creating um, resources around them is a huge part to making them, oh, thank you, um, <laughs> to making them accessible. Um, can go ahead. So now I, I just wanted to point to existing resources uh, where we where we can find data related to what we that I know of. And obviously, you all have been doing this work for a while, and probably have even more um, places to point to. But you can go ahead and go and. So oh, and then so I I am like obsessed with quotes. You'll see a lot of these in this presentation. Justin Reich is another um, really great person to, to follow. He's managing a research project out of um, MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is a quote just related to that data piece, like how important it is uh, to have data in order to know exactly what to make to serve people and to really bridge that divide. Okay, so we looked at this. Uh, Mary brought in some slides at the last event, and I just wanted to refresh everyone's memory. This is the broadband availability uh, um, data set that is available. I pulled just the Chittenden County um, stats here. It's hard to see. I know it's very small. But basically, it is an assessment of the, the total number of buildings and then the percentage of those buildings that have access to different levels of broadband. Um, this, this section is, is 100, um, 100 megabytes per second download and upload speed, so 100 over 100. And then it goes down 25 over 3 and then 4 over 1. So you can see like the different cities and towns in Chittenden County and how it breaks down. It, I mean, if you look at it, the uh, the rate for Burlington is 91.9 um, with 100 over 100. So that's pretty good. That's like, but what does that mean? Like, does that mean that these are the buildings now? These, this, so are like, are, is every apartment in that building have access? Like, how does it break down further? So I think there's some pieces there that we could learn more about. Um, Center for Rural Studies at UVM. I don't know if, if anyone has worked there or, or knows more about this. Um, I was intrigued by this report, but it's old. It's from 2010. And this report goes into a lot of detail about household internet connections through a survey. Uh, and this is Vermont-wide. So digging through this, this particular one I pulled as an example is just going into detail about um, uh, household income in comparison to access to, or ownership of computers, access to broadband, um, and then uh, so, some other combinations of the both. So I think this is great. If, if we could do this again, or yes, Lauren. Vermont Department of Public Service, 
is updating the 10-year telecom plan, which they do every three years. And so they will have the most accurate data around awesome. the state. I mean, along the lines of what Mary showed. But, okay. Uh, maybe even more detailed. So you can That's talk great. to them if you want more data. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check with you later to make sure we get it written down so I remember. Yes. The percentage with computer, is that considered like more desktop or smartphones or Chromebooks? Probably like anything that people can get access to. That's a great question. Um, a network with, I imagine. Yeah. No, that's a great question. I'm not sure. Um, and I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know how, a lot of the stuff I don't know how it breaks down. Like, you know, is it mobile? Is it, are they laptops, desktops? So. Yeah. 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 And so people with mobile internet connections. But when did the iPhone come out? So we're not. Yeah. So that data really doesn't work at all. But anyway, a really great place. Does anybody know Center for Rural Studies? Yeah. Okay. So do you know if that they're doing report more current reports in this type of way or? They're calling themselves now the Vermont Data Center. Okay. Michael Mosier is the primary contact there. Okay. So he's the person to ask about if they're <coughs> updating. And typically, they, they do contract work. So someone will hire them to update certain data sets. Okay. So he's a good resource to talk to about the status of the data. Great, perfect. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Um, and this little gem over here what is the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, the CEDS. And this is a, a, a report that uh, characterizes the state of Chittenden County's economy, its strengths, its weaknesses, um, opportunities, and threats. Um, and then identifies strategies and actions to maintain and to grow it. So this is a lengthy document, but it goes into a lot of detail. Um, and then I just put this image here because I think it's an interesting way to explain in really in a short way this circle of prosperity that they're talking about in this report, which is um, kind of how things like the health of people and the quality of education really affects um, the, the workforce, which in then affects the increase of regional income and opportunity, which then affects the healthiness of the environment and the vibrancy of, of where we live. So I put that in there as just kind of, I thought that was a neat way of doing it. Next slide. And so within that framework of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, here there's, there's more opportunities than what I pulled here, but these are the ones that are significantly uh, reflective of technology. So they kind of go through like engaging highly skilled and trainable retirement age population, because we have statistically, we have a, a large retirement population, um, supporting and growing new American populations. We have that unique feature here in this part of Vermont. Um, to promote telecommuni tel telecommuting and remote workforce here. So these are all opportunities that in this report, which is relatively recent, um, is pulled out as something we, we really need to take advantage of. So that's a great list. Next slide. Another thing this report does is um, suggest 14 initial target clusters and industries for attraction and development um, efforts. And out of the 14, almost half are technology related. So we have infotech here, um, uh, digital media, e-commerce, clean tech, and green tech. Um, we have nonprofit organizations. I think that ties very closely. And then we have higher ed. And I would say business and administrative services also is very closely related to this topic. Um, so I thought that was interesting that you know this report it's general it's it's looking at all industry but even in their suggestions of, of what we need to progress half of them almost are tech and digital related. Um, and so <clears throat> this kind of buried in this report is some something called the Environment Community Opportunity and Sustainability Scorecard. Has anybody heard of the scorecard? <laughs> Yeah, okay. 
So uh, what this scorecard is, is basically takes these um, top line, um, yes, there, there's indicators, but there's several indicators for each of the, I guess you would call them objectives um, or overall kind of um, markers? Results. Results, yes. So there's these results and then indicators that, that show how those results are met. Is that a good way of saying it? Um, so I kind of dug around, dug around, dug around. There, there, it's intriguing. It's, you know, if you like data and you like to read through this stuff, it, you should definitely go look through it all because it, it, it reports on all kinds of stuff like um, outside of tech, um, sustainability efforts, clean water, all kinds of stuff. So in my effort to find the broadband and internet related stuff, I, it was buried in this, in this a result here, which is to ensure adequate infrastructure and facilities, and then i.e. water supply, wastewater, stormwater, broadband, solid waste, and recycling. So it's buried in this, it's buried in like this um, infrastructure kind of group. And then in the indicators, there's no indicator that points to broadband. So I don't know how we could get that in there, and, and in my opinion even more, create a result that's only broadband and then have like a handful of, of indicators that speak directly to that. But I love this as a, as a tool. Next slide. And you probably are all familiar with the, the VTD performance dashboard that's online. Um, this is through the city website and each of these are clickable links that bring you to um, this, this dashboard that does an assessment of these different topic areas. And we have a city open data um, portal, which is where uh, the any open data, like where you can go search for broadband access, for example, would be located, or any other types of open data that we would want to find. Um, so, so I think this is a great place. I couldn't find much here yet, but I think it's an opportunity. It's brand new. It's brand new. Great. Okay. But I love that it's there. Yeah, I've gone. Okay, so that's kind of a landscape of all the things that I could find, and I'm very eager, and we'll have a chance to talk about more that aren't weren't there, because we can get them all written down. Um, I wanted to show some examples of digital inclusion initiatives in and outside of Vermont. And of course, here's another quote. Um, Dana Boyd is a researcher and author that is very well known um, on the, the writing about this topic and especially around teens and how they're using the internet. And she says, in a world where information is easily available, strong personal networks and access to helpful people often matter more than access to information itself. And I think that's very powerful and I agree <coughs> completely. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna go through all these projects and I'm gonna make this slide deck available after so you can if you'd like. But I do want to show one, two or three of these that I think are very, um, very influential for us in this context. And I think we'll go like from small to big. So there's, there's a project, and Abby introduced me to this, so I'm gonna let her speak about it, but it's called E2, E2D. It's located in Davidson, North Carolina. Do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, I'll just a Thank you. A quick overview of Davidson, North Carolina, for anyone who isn't familiar with E2D, is literally started with a, a, a daughter who came home and said to her dad, um, all of our homework assignments are on the internet, but I know that I have a friend who's homeless and she doesn't have a computer, she doesn't have a home, she doesn't have internet, that's not fair. And he said, you're right. And that has now grown into a digital inclusion effort that encompasses, it started in tiny little Davison. They raise money with lemonade stands every year. Um, Lowe's is headquartered near there, so they p ponied up some support. It's just a really great example of a very small town that made a very big um, uh, effort, it turned it into something even bigger. It's growing every year, and now they're, help, they're taking care of all the middle schools in Charlotte. So like they went from tiny to huge city. Um, so I think that's a really cool example of small and then growing to be something really big through something, just a simple question or um, a, 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 a young girl who pointed out something that's just not fair and it resulted in that. So I thought that was a really cool example. Yeah. Yeah, that's great grassroots kind of yeah. project to show. Can you click on Open Austin there? 
Um, so I have a tree set up. Let me just move that. I think it might be off of the system, but yeah, there we go. So, um, so Op Open Austin is um, a volunteer organization that's been running for several years now and is focused mostly on open data or started to as a focus on, on open data. So their, their mission in the beginning was to get the, um, the Austin government to share their data openly online. And they've been very successful. And so since they've, they've kind of reached these goals and as they reach these goals of certain data sets to become available, um, they've kind of expanded at the same time. So at the top here we have, there's um, events, projects, advocacy, and then just various ways of support. And each of these have, like the projects, do you, can you click on these? Yeah. So these are all open projects that live on GitHub, which is um, a place for sharing content and open source um, code. And these are all, you can see like there's a fake news project, there's community data project. Um, these are all community driven projects. So they've identified needs in their community um, in different regions in Austin and built these projects and Open Austin features them and hosts events around these projects. So there's just, there, there's a lot of ways that um, they're making they're making it possible for citizens and residents in these different areas to participate in the digital inclusion progress in these areas. So I think that's brilliant. And then the other thing they do, if you scroll all the way back up, um, go to advocacy. So they, they've created agendas that they've put here on the website and they've, can you click on candidate questionnaires? So they've actually prepared questionnaires anytime somebody runs for, for office that they send out to each candidate and they say, fill this out, and this speaks directly to the digital inclusion and particular needs that, um, that they've identified, and they say, what do you think about this? What would you do about this? What would you do? And so you can actually go through these and you can read each of the candidates' responses and get a very clear understanding of how they feel about digital inclusion. And if there's a plan or like, you know, if there's not a plan, all of that good stuff. So, and this is, this is the tip of the iceberg with this project. Um, so it's, it's like a little bit bigger than the grassroots North Carolina project, but it started there. And so now they have all these other elements that are embedded in it. Can you go back? Are they actually using GitHub as their platform for all this? Or can you, is it, is it, okay, so it's all hosted there? Well, it's all hosted there. Um, the site, I don't know if the site is open. It looks like it might be hosted there, but I'm not sure. But all of those projects are hosted on GitHub. And then if like resources, their, they, their prim primary goal is openness. So all of the resources that they use to run their organization is also on GitHub. Yeah, so you can access all of that stuff. Um, can you go back to the slide deck? We're gonna open up. It's okay, just go down and go back to, yep, that slide, 24, and click on the top link. It's gonna give you that thing, there you go. Thank you. So this is the kind of the next level, and this is the Austin City um, government page that is dedicated entirely to digital inclusion. So if you scroll down on this page, um, each council district has a report. And each of these reports is a highly detailed version of what digital inclusion looks like in that region or in that uh, district. So, I mean, click on one just as an example. So this goes into great detail about the events that are happening in that region. Um, what progress has been made for digital inclusion in that region, this, the data in that region. So it go, and Austin's a lot bigger than we are. So I mean, that says, I mean, that could go two different ways. Like it's a lot bigger so they have more resources or we're a lot smaller so we could do this too, right? Um, so maybe, maybe we could like, some, there's somewhere in the middle but 
but I just love how much um, detail is included in each of these reports. And on that main website page, there is a map that people can see any upcoming event related to digital inclusion and internet related and digital um, topics. Yeah, this one. Okay, let's go back to the slides. I have a question. Yeah. Um, are local people in general just putting information on this, or there's a specific group of people that put information that's available to everyone? That's a good question. The, for the events, I'm, it's probably, I have to look more closely, but it looks like people are just submitting events. So when they run an event, they post it. And then that gets shared on that kind of big map that we saw. But the reports themselves happen through the city. So they have, I'm guessing, either they work with organizations to do that research, or they have people that work internally. But those reports come from the city. They probably have to have passwords to get on there. Yeah, lots of passwords. Those are important. Um, so, so those are examples. The, a lot of these others are wonderful. I added some, some Burlington ones, and there's a lot more than this. But, um, but these were all really inspiring to Common Good for Vermont, Code for BTV, Burlington Tele Telecom's EduNet and Lifeline. Um, so, so there's lots of stuff happening locally here that we can use as an example and leverage. Um, but yeah, just kind of a snapshot. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so what do we wanna do? The big question of the evening. Um, time is it right now? Does anybody know? 6.40. Okay, great, perfect. We have plenty of time. Um, again, this is, I don't know what had just happened. Is that an old quote? Did I do this one? Can you go back a slide? Okay, great. So we're, we're in the right place. So this was, um, we're going to break up net right now and have a break, but also but also um, think about and brainstorm some questions particularly. And if you go to the next slide, Abby. Um, so, so I don't know what we want to do. I don't have the answer. None of us have that exact like thing that's going to make everything better, right? But we have each other and we have all of this experience. So these are some things that we can tonight um, start to brainstorm around. So. One is do more research. Um, and <clears throat> we have, I've put these posters up around the room, so I don't know which, where this one is, but it's either, how can we improve, how can I help? Yes, so there's a poster back there that says, who can help us get the data we need to identify barriers to digital inclusion? So like, you know, Lauren had some great suggestions. So anything related to people, organizations, initiatives, uh, research hubs, like who, who can we reach out to to help us try to get more specific with this data? Um, identify existing resources. Uh, what, would, what would a one-stop one shop look like for digital inclusion in Vermont? Like, would, could we model it after Open Austin? Like, what, or we, would we want to put it on that um, city portal that I showed as an example? Like, where would it live? What would it look like? Um, and then build alliance. So, you know, having, having strong advocacy and support and buy-in from the mayor's office and other, other um, institutions that are very prominent here is really important. Um, and just recognizing that no single organization can solve the digital divide, right? It's a, it's, it's a combination of many. Um, so, you know, what would those guiding principles be for digital inclusion and, and how would we be able to craft them with all of the expertise in the room? And then just uh, reaching a targeted population. You know, we have all of these great diverse communities here, seniors, the unemployment population, low-income households, new Americans, public housing residents, veterans. So there's like all of these very specific groups that um, if we had more data, we, w we might know how to serve them better and, and bridge that gap. So these are some top line things um, to, to kind of think about. And what we're going to do next is, um, next slide. We're going to focus on these three questions. And I pointed out one already, which is um, who can help us get this data? 
how do we how do we start this? Who who can we talk to? Um, and there's markers, and I have some post-it notes. So we're going to add ideas related to that question in the back. The second question is, how can we improve future meetings like this, um, and what could we include to make them more beneficial? So like. Like I said in the beginning, I'm hoping this is the first of many conversations. So what would we want in the next one? How could we really um, start to be effective with this group and on this topic? And the last question here is, what is our BHAG for this movement? And what is the change we want to see? Does anybody know what BHAG stands for? I have a hand in the back. Big, scary, audacious goals. Exactly. So in other words, what is that big, crazy goal that we, um, that we want for this movement, this digital inclusion movement? Um, so all answers are welcome. This is a brainstorming opportunity. Um, and then in addition to that question is just, what is the change we want to see? So we may not have these answers tonight. It's likely we don't, because we don't have a lot of information yet. But we could have fun brainstorming a little there. The last poster I have is the parking lot poster. And this is a very important poster because this parking lot poster, which is in the back as well, is, um, is a place for you to add things that aren't on these posters yet. So questions that we still have that I didn't address, um, topics or concerns that you didn't, we didn't address tonight that would affect digital inclusion, um, suggestions, anything that you think is relative to this conversation but can't put it on a poster, throw it in the parking lot, and we'll use it for the next conversation. Um, I think that's the last slide. Is that the last one? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Wow, oh, I failed. It's all over. We can all go home. Um, OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there before we jump on these posters here and take questions if you have them. I w would like everyone to go on a break. You know, I've been talking for a while, um, but yeah, what do you got? Any questions? What is the big <laughs> hairy goal here? Yeah, good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I'm, I'm, good question, and I don't have the answer. If you stop moving, the floor, be the floor becomes lava, or room becomes dark or something. <laughs> we all have to constantly shift yeah, and move. The motion detector is only over there, which makes no I'm curious, I mean, does anybody have a thought on, on that, what that goal would be? I think mine would be, like, every single person in Burlington has, sorry, every single person in Burlington and then Chittenden County and then Vermont and then the country and then the world has, has affordable or, you know, whatever free super affordable access to the fastest internet available um, and all of the tools and resources necessary to use it. I think we should rephrase that. I think everyone should be able to make their network, their personal network, access any other network on the planet. Yes. Because it. they want to inter-network it with the other networks on the planet and they need to own and have their own network first to inter-network with another network. And whether their network is simply their phone and so I'm asking those questions, whether it's a phone or a Chromebook or a more comprehensive computer and may have a router or a network. You know, what, what is it? Where is that barrier? And if you know someone only has a phone, but they say they, they're connected, are they? Do they have their own network that can connect to other networks? Is that the barrier? I think those are good questions to ask. I love that that's an example then of how that is two different things. You know, it's different for every one of us and the people who have no interest. I, I'm, I'm struggling with the big goal too, but for me, it's something different than digital, my voice carries. It's something different than um, just giving people access because in 2017, more people have access than they used to. But I often say that as we talk about a digital economy, the pace of change is accelerating in our society and wrapped around digital technology. Digital technology is empowering us, but also changing our world. And, and I summarize that when I'm talking about what I'm trying to do is to make sure that this disruption is happening for us as a community and not happening to us. Now, that means lots of all kinds of very woolly things, but it's the fact that our employers are able to use, to, to be current 
with, with people using the te technology in a way that they, access, they get access to the right employees and that our recent graduates are speaking the same digital language as our employers, for example. Or that something that works for you today um, doesn't change on you. The, the internet, somebody said the internet's always changing. So how do we make sure that we're riding that wave and we're proactive? And it's a very, very broad thing and I think it needs to be nailed down. But that, there's something around that that for me is a big challenge. you showed from the Austin community-based was hosted on GitHub. And if that's really done on GitHub and it's all open source, I think that's a crucial piece of the model. That I think it's very important that whatever happens here is there's a very, it's, it's important that much if not all of it is done in, op, in open source tools with available code and that any research is reproducible research so that you're publishing, here's the code we used to process the data, here's the link to the data, here's the report that came out of it so somebody else can dissect it and, and it is fully transparent. Yeah. Um, if we build that into the culture of what we're doing and then we also bridge to the mm. maker community who is working with you know, Raspberry Pis, Pis and Arduinos and experimenting and making everything from art to robots with this technology using um, open source tools in transparent ways. We make this more accessible to everybody. I think that's a real, that, that um, accessibility takes the mystery out of it and makes it available to all of us. Um, hold on one minute. Alex, are you good? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, we'll, do, we'll do a couple more. I saw three hands go up. And then I do want to capture these suggestions so they don't get lost in the air. Um, so let's do the, the rest, that I, the hands I saw. Oh, are you writing? Yes, in the front. Uh, I find that uh, my difficulty uh, is that uh, people, even though they know a lot about the internet, don't know how to teach it. Mm. And they'll, uh, uh, they'll go off into the jargon of the internet and lose me within seconds. Yeah. And, and uh, you're always trying to you know, get what they're saying, but they're, they're going so fast and, and uh, aren't really good teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that's a skill that's very different than uh, the average teacher. I, I, I agree completely. We're getting all these notes down, yes. I was gonna piggyback on what Barbara said in saying that we need um, classes that have extremely easy ways to understand things. And I think we should use Mac computers because I think they're a lot easier. Uh, maybe there's some place at part of City Hall where they have classes on a weekly basis where people can come in and people can teach them on a one on one on one to help them find exactly the things that they need. Mm -hmm. And I would look to think um, there was a book written by one of the um, Photoshop gurus on how to use your iPhone when it first came out. And I compared that with the one for those other computers. And all I'd say is it was so easy you could understand it that maybe we can look to someone like that to write a comprehensive use of the internet book that goes nationwide or international so we can start all having similar or the same language. If I could just quickly add, yeah. Jessamine West, who's a librarian in Vermont, has written that book, actually, oh. and she does work on digital inclusion. Um, I think she'd great. be a great person to bring up here. Um, and it, she has given very simple ways to discuss how to use computers, how to use the internet, um, uh, working in all different kinds of demographics. 
Uh, she's That's also true. she serves on the board of Wikim, uh, Wikimedia, Wikipedia yeah. as well. So she's and very, she's based in Vermont. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Maybe we need to get, get her, her to come up. We need to get her to come next time. If only we had a librarian in the room. Yeah. I'm <laughs> Jessamine. I'm friends with Jessamine. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the right. yeah. yeah. But I, I, I think that I mean I think sometimes we do we keep hearing you know this is something that yeah. the library can do yeah. and we do we have classes we you can book a librarian and they will sit side by side with you and do those things. Um, sometimes our resources are really stressed right now. And I think a lot of what we're hearing now is we're getting the late, 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 late adopters, and they are definitely the hardest folks to bring along. Um, and it's a challenge. Yeah. But I'm hearing a lot of similar kind of feelings and thoughts here. Web literacy, digital literacy. In the back? You want visual literacy. So people visual. can understand. Yeah. Visually, not verbally. Right. Well, this will be something entirely different, um, and I may end up making a total fool of myself. Even though I've worked in technology for quite a while, I don't think of my digital IQ as being particularly high. Uh, but Barbara and I live in a community of 32 families, and they're all ages, um, lots of different abilities, lots of different incomes. Um, we're basically a privileged community, so it's, um, it's it may, it, Anyway, there, there may be some benefits, and but it's a community we could study. Yeah. It's a community where, I mean, it's already happening. Like Canopy mm -hmm. that you introduced. Well, I've been going to different families and, and showing them how they can get access to that. And so, but that's just a, a minor example. I mean, we have people at so many different levels. We could do a survey very easily. I, I just wouldn't know how to go it would be nice to make a study out of this thing. Start with a survey so we could identify where we're starting at, try to define a goal of where we want to be, and then sort of measure that and figure, you know, it would be, be a nice project that we could use as a model for doing this with other communities. Now there's, being a co-housing community, collaboration is a really key piece, and we're learning how to do that. And one of the things we're learning is about how uh, the internet uh, is a source of abuse. It's a source of, uh, you, you need to be careful. I mean, uh, we have more, we're gradually having more rules within our community about what you say in an email to everybody and what you don't and what, you know. So there's that piece. So there's the social piece as well as the, the uh, digital skills and resources. And I don't have, I mean, I have a, a little piece of an idea of how we could do this, but boy, if we would do this, I would need a lot of help. Um, just even a, a coming up with the original survey, and I would love for that to happen. And how do we deploy it so that the people who need it are taking the survey? It would have to be super grassroots, I think, which is yeah. kind of exciting. Yeah. Like, it can't well, be something we put out example. on the internet. <laughs> that's a perfect example, like having people invested and involved that could say, like, take the survey so that we know how, what, who we need to serve and how we can serve you better. Right. Well, we, can, we, just, we just did a survey and got 41 responses out of 65, which, which are a whole different thing. But yeah. it's a community where you can do that. And, and, but I wouldn't even know exactly how to, what questions to ask uh, right. to begin with. Um, right, and that's what we, we would want to build. That's yeah. what, something we could think about here with, the, with this group. Yes? Yeah. I think the... Um, notion of reaching folks where they're at and trying to really assess what are their barriers to accessing um, the digital economy and I, I, I serve on a few boards and in a couple cases residents one of them is affordable housing it's Northgate Apartments actually and one of the few of the board members don't use email and don't use the internet and it really puts them at a significant disadvantage and I can already tell that there's like a a divide in our group and it's unfortunate because the board is almost all residents I happen to be a community member who serves on that board but it's it's ten residents and four community reps and it's the largest affordable housing complex in Vermont it's wow. resident owned resident controlled it's a truly unique community yeah. but right there in that group we've got folks who are being left out and left yes. behind so I think engaging people where they're at to find out what would make you more able and capable to access technology do you want to first of all of course right. 
And if you do, and you see the benefits, what supports do we need to give you to be able to access that? And if you don't, why not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so kind of related to that, um, I, I was on a board that's kind of, um, I'm one of the youngest people on it. It's mostly kind of two generations above me. Um, and so we had, a, there's a lot of tension for a while over tech, use of technology because there's, and I think this is something that uh, I'm, I'm involved in the neighborhood planning assembly in the, in the new north end. And this is something I think there too where we see kind of open meeting law hasn't caught up with what's possible for engaging online governance. Um, and so we eventually got to the point where I sat down with all the people on the board who wanted to and was like, this is why we, we don't send attachment emails. This is why we use Google Docs instead. This is, and this is how we use this kind of online voting system so we don't have to make all of our decisions in in-person meetings. And after, when it was kind of, when we got drilled down and got clear on what are the benefits of these things, adoption was very quick. Yeah. But it was sort of, there was sort of, there's kind of like a block of, without sort of co comprehending what those benefits were, you know, why learn the new system if the old system is somewhat workable even because those those gains in efficiency and sort of what's possible yeah. um, aren't visible. And so the thing that I've been kind of really thinking about in terms of setting goals is, um, you know, so, so the idea of having in-person once a month neighborhood meetings is great, but it also, there's inherently just a limited number of people who can show up and be involved in things that are, you know, key for engagement with city councilors and you know development planning in the in each neighborhood and if you know we can kind of set for me what the big hairy audacious goal would be is getting the citizenry of Burlington to the point where we could have complementary online platforms that could mm -hmm. that that people would feel comfortable with but that could engage a vastly greater number of people than are currently engaged by these in-person meetings yeah that's great I think we I think we got those. I think we got the notes down. Lauren's <laughs> writing vigorously over there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I saw a hand over here. I just want to point out from just hearing the room, I just hear three basic categories, which is just general access to internet working, education about anything and everything surrounding technology, and then particularly applications which are much more thermal and are, are going to move. You know, the thing that might be applicable today might, it just might be something better tomorrow. Like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, email was so like awesome and fast and neat, right? But yeah, we have a better way of doing it. No. <laughs> no, it's a nightmare. Yeah, Listeners. for a lot of things. <laughs> also the irony or hypocrisy or I don't know the right word of like, clearly we're all in this room because of the internet. Like that's how you found out about this meeting but we didn't do anything to reach out to the people who were trying to help. So what, how, did, how do we bridge that and make, make <laughs> this, this whole thing more inclusive, let yeah. alone to solve inclusion, yeah. He's got yeah, Go um, this is perhaps a, an oblique comment, but I think maybe necessary is to think about um, consent with who gets the internet and whether they want it in the first place. We've heard like titterings of that um, in other comments, but I just want to drill down and say that as we think of the internet as a salutary uh, force, it's, you know, it has all these benefits, good for job applications, increasingly necessary um, in, throughout your life. It's also um, can be used as a tool as for surveillance and for privacy violations. And with many of the targeted groups, they are also targeted groups, they right? Are. So they're, yeah. um, uh, when we think about the ways that we're going to bring out uh, um, surveys to vulnerable communities and then how to engage them in ways that um, first has their consent, that, that they want to be using the internet, and then also that uh, whatever apps or resources that are provided to them have very transparent ways of saying this is how your data is being collected, how it's being used, um, and that if you want to request your data, you can. Um, other people were talking about open source and GitHub. That's one effort for transparency. Uh, so I, I guess I would, I would be concerned in the process that both in method and in outcome, there's privacy built in. Yeah. And I think that, that also ties into um, the notion of having 
being a contributor to what content's being created. Right. So, uh, like, at, at a very basic level, like, if we're going to make surveys or ask for information, like, maybe the people who we're surveying should have a role in that process, or, uh, you know, whatever the case. So, but that's a that's a really good thing to remind us of. Yes. That was sort of related to what I was going to say. Is that I, I have serious concerns about people using the free apps and thinking it's so cool. And there's so much going on that they don't know. And we don't really have a good way of, um, of, of, right now there's no rules about that. So I have concerns about all the Google apps that everybody, you know, uses. And so I, you know, and even Facebook and, you know, Twitter and all of these things, I choose not to have a Facebook account, not because I'm technologically illiterate and could not, could do it. I'm very concerned about this. And, and so, one of the scary things is that this inclusion process and access process is, is layering on top of free apps that are to make it convenient and efficient for us to network and get to know each other and share information and documents. But in fact, it's just totally being data mined, profiled, and, and, and so it really, it bothers me that every time somebody says, oh, let's just, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, the Google Docs thing, uh, you know, it, and others, we don't have platforms that are actually the equivalent that we know what's going on and that we have, have the ability to, to say no. And so I'm really supportive of what you're saying because to me, uh, it's really a tricky thing right now because the way everybody's connecting with is free apps mm -hmm. and you don't have any control over exactly. what's going on. And the people that do Ancestry DNA, I mean, what are you thinking? Yeah. Things so, like that. Just crazy. Well, let's do you next, and then we'll go over here. Okay, I have a candidate, BHAG. What? Oh, okay. Candidate what? For the BHAG. Big Area Audacious oh, Goal. Oh, the BHAG. Okay. Open source, user completely owned and controlled data version of Facebook. Whoa. Isn't that Elon? Social, no. Uh, they're, it's not. They're VC that, funded. Okay. Let's do it. Social.coop. Right, yeah, great. I mean, LO, LO yeah, which is I in like Burlington, it. is kind of a step yeah. towards that. But I don't use Facebook for some of the same reasons. Yeah. That, that I, I won't put anything out there that I, of mine that I can't take back. And I mean, yeah, and there, there's so many parts to that. And there's so many ways. It's still, I think, knowing what those vulnerabilities are are a part of, a part of digital inclusion. Except, so, yeah. <laughs> So, choosing not to use it is very much part of the conversation, but knowing why you're choosing and like what you can say, I don't want to use this because it does, I have to sign this agreement that makes me get this. So, so, so like so, that literacy is a big part of this conversation. In effect, a movement to build a we own it, we manage it, we use these principles to guide yeah. what's out there this is a very different approach. Yes. Okay. Um, my BHAG would be to live in a community where there where there are no barriers to enter, awesome. you know, to connection. Right. So, mm -hmm. so um, we need that data. Right. Find right. out what those barriers. And are. I and I would just echo what you said about there's definitely a literacy component about oh. under working working with what you have and making it as safe and secure. And you can even be <laughs> offensive in the way you act online that can thwart some of those things. But people have to know, and you have to teach them. Um, and, and having a healthy digital community does that. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I'm choosing to be excluding, excluded yeah. because yeah. of the, the lack of ability to control anything. Exactly. So, and you, have, and, and you, you are fortunate because you have all of that knowledge to say, like, this is dangerous. But so I'm also excluded from participating. Exactly. My sisters. And my, my friends know more about my sister's activities than I do. I don't participate in LinkedIn, so professionally I have challenges. Yep. Any of those things. It's yep. really a digital exclusion of a different form. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that brought me to the points I was making. I'm really trying to take a step back and say, what are we talking about as a group here? And what I tend to get into with folks that don't understand technology is we're talking about this application or that application or this application. And all is built off of two things, which is really the networks you're talking about, uh, the computer systems that use those networks, um, and our part of that network, 
and the literacy around that, the education around that. Um, and that's what she's really getting at. And part of that might even be you can't necessarily even escape the surveillance around you. How many people have a cell phone in their pocket right now that's picking up your voice, picking up everything we're doing, like every moment we're here? You can't actually escape it. How many people are running a messenger app on their phone right now that's picking up everything we're doing? But there's at least one in the room. Um, point being is education lets you understand what the applications can do and what what the capability of these systems might be. Um, it might be better to flood with disinformation and to think that you can actually avoid it completely. Um, but that's an education thing. It's not about whether you're using that application or not. Um, does that make sense? The default should be privacy, not open it and give it all away. That's my concern. Because I, you can't educate You just don't live in well. that world, is, really I guess, the much. education I'm trying to get. Yeah. Is that just an education aspect and a network aspect? And we, we get lost in these conversations, way in applications, talking about this application or that application. And I, I think it would be very difficult to, to <coughs> start saying, unless we come up with like something, is, is there some kind of application that we think is really going to help our community access the internet and education around the internet? Um, like I, I, that's why I'm having a hard time synthesizing from our conversation. Yeah. And the, I mean, the, so another thing is just like, we should have something to match an online service in an offline way. So like this education that we're speaking of, you know, obviously putting stuff online is, is very beneficial for people who know how to get to it and feel comfortable getting at it, but we should also have things available for people that don't feel comfortable in those spaces, but can access the same information and learn the same thing in perhaps an in-person session or with printouts. I mean, it's like for providing options, I think, at least at the stage we're at, and the, the communities we would maybe wanting to reach is important. I'm looking at hearing everyone and just my own, having been with the internet for years, I still get lost on, I still get mixed up, I still hit the wrong thing, I still have pages <laughs> fly up or blow up or won't, won't open. And I'm looking at things that ARP has with that little phone that's supposed to be a simpleton phone and it has I think six or seven words on it, it has phone, it has messages, it has photos and you just Push, I presume you just push it and it opens up. And I'm looking at perhaps we need to really write a software, maybe it's specifically a software for a town that wants to have a private um, or just in town space that we use, or regardless, one that's super simple for us to use. So when someone opens up the computer screen, all they do is press go or they press stop, or they press, you know, they press maybe one of four words to get where they need to go, and it, and it just keeps simplifying the process. Um, and instead of complicating it as I feel it does, as I try to dig beyond the very basic thing, and even still, I'm trying to go to Google, and sometimes it doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen, so can, can some of us, start writing or is there some software out there that's called easy for the seniors one word only at a time you know and and um, you know that could be cool if people here could write it and then it could be sold to other people and uh, that we could make a little that would I would love it these are all really great suggestions um, so I mean, obviously, it's going to take us a little while to figure out what we want to do and to figure out what that big, hairy, audacious goal could be for this group. Um, and I think it'll be in steps. So for, so for the next, like if we think about this as, if we think about this as a movement, let's say, a local movement to really kind of uh, grow digital inclusion in the area. What would be our immediate next steps? Would we want to turn this into a regular gathering? How frequent would it be? Would we want to create um, a, a, a place online for us to connect using an app like Signal that's encrypted and very and one of the safest that exists as far as privacy is concerned right now, where we could connect with each other? 
um, and share content? Would we want to, I mean, what, what, what do you think, like how could we, how could we move forward in a small way um, and to meet the capacities we all have and the interests that we all have? What do you think? What would be good? Like synthesizing a lot of these comments is the first thing. I think, you know, I will collect it all. Lauren. I think there's a lot of work that's been going on for a long time on this issue. Yeah. And I'm not sure mm -hmm. starting a movement is particularly the next move. I mean, in my opinion, I think there is uh -oh. there are a, lot of a decentralized, groups. here's the future, <laughs> um, a decentralized um, effort. I think that we need to identify who's doing this work and needs, and we can leverage their efforts. Great. Because there is already work that's going on yeah. to yeah. give resources, skills, training, whatever, through the library and maybe other places. And the library's probably got resource constraints and they've got issues that they can use help with. So I would say leverage what we're already doing instead of creating new work and then see what the data actually does show about where the gaps are that, for example, the library or other entities are, may not know. And that might point towards another area or a particular group of people, as you said. Yep. But I think that we want to we want to apply our effort to what's working and help it work better. I agree. And then from that, new things might come. But there isn't anything new that anyone's said. I think what we're missing as a community is a digital security plan. And that might not be the way to put it, but that we actually have a plan mm -hmm. about how we, what our goals are, and which I think is what you're trying to get at. Mm -hmm. What are our goals as a community? You know, we want open networks, we want access for all, we mm -hmm. want whatever the people have said. And then, we want privacy protection, and then each one of those has deliverables underneath them. You know, the, in the legislature, they're looking at privacy and for data, um, not only for broadband providers, but data aggregators, mm -hmm. right? So there's stuff going on now. Mm -hmm. There's stuff, there's, there's a telecom plan going on, and nobody ever shows up to talk about it, you know, when they ask for input. So, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so I'm just. This is a long way of saying. I just think there's a lot happening and building on that inventory of what's happening, yeah. and seeing what resources are needed, and then the collective effort of this group of intelligence can help put pressure yeah. in a movement-like way right. on those areas where we need to leverage more resources or more protection. Yeah, I saw lots of hands kind of sprinkle. It's it's. Just a quick story about something that happened here when when the city was pursuing a cable company, and the cable um, the cable company said to the city, and this was when Bernie was mayor, we're going to stop you. And Bernie said, Yeah, right, you're going to stop us. We're going to do it anyway. They said, Okay, how? What do you need? And Bernie said, I need you to ensure that senior citizens living in public housing and other low-income seniors will have a fixed cable rate for forever. And it didn't last forever, but it lasted as long as that company was around. And, and he only got a million dollars as well to please the city. So it was a $10 flat fee for all seniors um, from there on that lasted for well over a decade, probably 15 years, maybe maybe closer to 20. And it was before BT arrived, obviously. So I'm just saying something like that that ensures access for folks who really need access would make a huge difference. And yeah. I think and we just have to be practical. We have to be. Like that piece. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right, and a device too, right. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm looking at this and seeing all these different areas. And let's see if we can't pick one. Maybe it's the library where we can let everyone know that if you have questions at all about the internet, you can go to the library as a starting point because you're, they're always there. So we don't have to worry about someone not being there. And people can go to the library free. It's wheelchair accessible. It has bathrooms. It has nice places to sit. And that at least it, the conversation can be started there. Perhaps we can help initiate um, or fundraise 
whatever you might need to start collecting information that people is, are bringing in, access uh, and helping you get access that they need to use so that they can work on the internet and let you be the focal point with, from which we all can bring in information. And as you have questions, you can come back to us. Maybe we form an email forum to come back to us, but we need to centralize all of this into one space, and it seems like we really need education, and we need access, and we want some privacy, and we need to simplify the whole system. I think it's really interesting that in both our, our Innovation Week event and this one, we, we landed at, we have so many resources. How do we let everyone know about them, and then how do we utilize them and leverage them? Uh, in the ways that we need, and I, yeah, building a new collection or growing your collection at the library might be exactly it, and then how do we get the, the word out that that is the hub for Burlington digital inclusion. I, and just uh, talking about resources, we know that BT offers a very reduced rate to folks in the community, $10 a month, but we have people that aren't taking advantage of it. So we, I, we still feel like, what are what are the barriers? Why is it they don't have the device? Is it that they're nervous about security? Is it, and I think we really need to, to drill down to that. I would yeah. say that usually when people are struggling that hard, going to check all their keys and get everything figured out is probably very difficult yeah. for them. We have to get to them because they can't. Mm -hmm. They yeah, can't. Exactly. Well, we can go to senior citizen places, but I'm saying let's take the library as the hub from which everything Yes. And do a fundraiser for it. I think what's most interesting to me in this whole conversation, and certainly it's things we've thought about before, you know, we've been sitting here talking today, is the idea of regionalization, right? So coming from Winooski, you know, we talk about things that are happening in Burlington. I think quite often our community is compared, I think other communities, you know, we can talk about assets and stuff like that, are kind of unfairly, it's different sizes, obviously there's different tax bases. I think regionalization is huge. So. You know, we talk about you know some of these things with Burlington Telecom. I know one of our projects that our planning commission is looking at right now. I don't know if you guys saw this, but um, there's the Main Street Revitalization Project. So within that, there is sort of this research around including you know along with you know some of the stuff that you were showing about wastewater and all of that stuff. It is very much included to sort of think about high speed internet, fiber and stuff. The City Lights Building. Um, I love the City yeah. Lights Building. <laughs> So Which they uh, they have you know the Burlington Telecom, correct me if I'm wrong, supply gig gigabit. Yeah, exactly. So many of our community members always ask, how come we don't have access to Burlington Telecom? By, by the way, your town offices have Burlington Telecom as well. Right. You may not even know that. <laughs> right. So yeah, a lot of our community members say, why are we why are we boxed into Comcast? Why don't we have access to this Burlington Telecom? And in that conversation, one of the most fascinating things I saw. One of the LOIs was, was sort of this idea that it could be regionalized or it could be offered at least to other communities to get into that. And I think to answer a lot of these questions that we're talking about, whether it's security or access or anything, regionalization is huge. So they talk about regionalizing you know, the, the emergency response system, you know, the 911 stuff. There's mm -hmm. conversations about regionalizing the airport. There's sort of, I think we, we often get lost within our own boundary lines, right? And I think that's it's huge in the work that we're trying to do. I think it's going to be huge in the work that. Yeah, everybody's trying. So, so let, let me just clear up quickly that thing that the whole reason that BT got eight letters of intent was because of the regionalization aspect <coughs> and the whole focus going forward is expanding more broadly throughout Chittenden County and, and that'll start happening sooner, sooner rather than later and the whole focus beyond that should be how do we actually broaden even further so that broadband can become a reality in some of the more remote communities. You know, Vermont is full of meaningfully underutilized fiber networks that crisscross the state, that, that run past most towns and cities, or through most towns and cities in the state, and they're just sitting there unused. So, couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, and I wonder too if, you know, to sort of share the burden, right? If, if an organization like the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, CCRPC, you know, they've been, they've been super gracious with us in a number of, with a huge amount of projects, and it's great. They've got a great team. They're a huge resource for us. Um, you know, I think, I think regionalization is, is going to be key for a lot of these things. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great point. It's a clue.
Yeah, um, is there a mailing list or a website or something where I could access or others could access yeah, the no. things that we've been talking about? Is there one to tap into? Is there anyone here that didn't actually register for the event online? And if, yeah, so if you didn't, I know how to get to you, Doug. But <laughs> anybody who didn't register online, if you want to just give us your contact information before you go, and then we'll yeah, create. We could, yeah. yeah, we can use you know this group as a way to start a community. Um, but also, if there's one that already exists, we could connect there as well. So I don't, I don't know. It's kind of a question and a and an offer at the same time. Like we could. Abby and I can work to, you know, connect all of us um, maybe on an we build email. that through the library. Something maybe through the yeah. library. I don't know. We can figure that out. But also, if that already exists somewhere, like there's a community that it's good to leverage to continue this conversation, we could also do that. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on the best thing to do. Is that is it almost 7:30 right yeah. now? I'd say listen to a lot of different ideas. That one thing that I've learned building products um, for a while is that it's easy to get ahead of yourself and to start thinking about the features and the um, aspects that you're going to be delivering. But the real key is whose life you're making better through the product. And so yeah. if we're looking at digital inclusion, then the first people that we should be talking to are people who are digitally excluded. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's tough to, you can get really ahead of yourself thinking about what you think their problems are, but until you actually meet them and talk to them and understand, it could be a different, a different whole concept. Um, so the things that we might think in this room might not be the real solutions that they need. Don't so create that, a solution for a problem that doesn't actually yeah. exist. <laughs> so that data, that like information is the key. So I, I would, I, I'm like, I'm kind of metric skeptical. So I, I really like talking to people. Yeah. Um, so I would try to find the people that whose lives would be better. Because lots of stuff can get lost as tabulation happen. Yeah. Um, and so I think that could be an, a, a, an interesting next step is say, if we had an inclusive uh, Burlington, uh, what would be different? And who, who, who are the people that we think would have a delta of change here? And go to them and say, how, how would you feel about this idea at the library or this other idea? Or what's your idea? Any mayoral or city county council candidates that, as they're knocking on doors, would be willing <laughs> to start those conversations for us? Sure. Like information? Sure. I plan on doing that. <coughs> yeah, I'm running in Ward 3, and I plan on. And there's someone else who's here. Yeah. yeah. We, have, we have in Burlington bike recycle, where if your income below a certain threshold, They'll set you up with a bicycle and a lock for $25. And they have a program where they train young people to work on bikes. And um, you know, that it's a great program. Between resource and the schools, we can do a program where kids are learning how to repair computers, are showing up to somebody's house, and for $20, here's a used laptop or a used computer. I mean, resources selling used machines with Windows on them for $75. Mm -hmm. That's actually included in our EdgeNet program. Right? Are so we trying to work with resource? And, and for a number of years now, and what the challenge we found is really them being able to have enough scale and capability to, to do anything in a meaningful way. We've even bought machines, refurbished machines from resource and then further subsidize them to deliver at an even cheaper price to low-income families. Yeah. But it, it's never proved to be sustainable because of just the lack of hardware. And our inability to get to the, the uh, populations that need it the most so that they know that this resource exists. So, so a little program mm. that struggles, we can learn from yeah. and build on. I just wanted to say is that I did a lot of photos at COTS and met some of the people there who are part of COTS and it's a group of maybe 30, 40 people. Perhaps we could start right there. They're homeless, some of them, mm -hmm. they're most of them. 
And that's why we start small and see what we can do with them. I know the heads of it. I think, so it would, I'm kind of leaning towards now after hearing all of this is maybe we should plan the next conversation, but it's invite individuals from communities or <laughs> uh, places that are within, have those barriers, yes. maybe, um, as a next step at least. To start to, because I don't, yeah, I don't think we know really enough right now about what we need to make or, or how we need to do this. So maybe that's something we could work on. Um, and then what we'll do is send you just a follow up and maybe a survey just to get feedback on this event. And in that survey, it could be like, what communities do you know of that we could reach out to to invite to the next conversation? So we can start to think about what to build and how to what we need to do. Does that sound like a good plan at least for? I still think we ought to have a target at the library right away, yeah. just to start collecting data from people who come in. We'll figure something out. Yeah, we'll talk. That sounds great. So, um, so yeah, thank you everyone for, for joining. This was a really amazing conversation. I'm thrilled with everyone, everyone's experience and contribution tonight. Um, and I can't wait to read through those notes that Lauren's taking because there was so much good stuff that was said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for doing Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>